Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the pleasure to be discussing with you one of the great and classic topics of all time in biology, and that is the cell cycle, and in particular, how we believe it is regulated. You know, you gotta think about this. Um, the topic is of huge importance. It's absolutely critical. I am, as you know, if you're familiar with me, prone to hyperbole at, on occasion. But I think I'm well within my means to say that this is one of the most widely studied, most important topics of all time in biology. Because if you think about it, and let me just start off with this right here. If you think about it, when you look at a cell and it's going through the process of mitosis, you think eukaryotic cells, every eukaryotic cell is undergoing this. It's a process of division, in other words, the organism, if it's a, a unicellular organism, it's the very sense of it reproducing. It's the cell theory. It's one cell begets another. And so it's so fundamental, and more importantly than that, understanding like how it works and how chromosomes condense during prophase and how in prometa they're, pro, they're uh, taken to the center of the cell in the equator and then they're pulled across with such high fidelity that each sister chromatid is, is uh, separated in the process of anaphase. And we know this process at, called mitosis. The thing about it is, how is it regulated? How do cells know when to divide and how often to divide? These are the questions that we have. And, and then more importantly, we know that sometimes cells can do things that are not absolutely correct. And we get into things like a uh, discussion of cancer, one of the, one of the all-time uh, killers of humanity and other, or, uh, other organisms as well. And so this is a discussion looking at that process of, of what we may know about regulation of the cell cycle. So I, ho I hope you enjoy it. Hope you learn a few things about this. And so one of the things that I want to say right out of the gate is, let me get this going here. One of the things I want to say is that the machinery of the cell in terms of the cell cycle and mitosis is curiously transitory, meaning that the cell is able to take proteins and synthesize them, in particular the proteins of tubulin, and, and polymerize these long cables in the cell called microtubules. You may know them as the spindle. And so they elongate by the cell producing these proteins and then they extend out and they help to move the chromosomes around in the cell. And so they do that by incorporating these little subunits called tubulin. And so they're able to elongate, it's pretty cool. But then the cell removes these uh, and then it builds them back up and then it removes them and builds them back up. And so it's kind of interesting. Uh, you can see here in green the, the intense microtubule network called the spindle that is able to move the chromosomes of the genetic material to the true equator of the cell. And this is a beautiful picture of, inter of uh, metaphase of mitosis. Now, what's interesting about this, before we get into the regulation, I just wanted to sort of uh, discuss a little bit about cell division. You know, we always talk about what's happening in the nucleus. We talk about how chromosomes are formed and how they're, uh, they're separated during mitosis, the movement of DNA. But I want to discuss just briefly, like, what about the other organelles? Uh, when the cell divides, as you can see here in cytokinesis, um, what are some of the strategies that are in play to make sure that the other organelles that need to replicate are partitioned equally? Well, one of the things, one of the most important organelles of all are ribosomes, and those are, these are proteins wrapped around by ribonucleic acid, which are the site of protein synthesis, and there's literally millions inside the cell, and so it goes under the, the idea that you know, when an organelle is that abundant, all things being equal is when you divide the cell, you're probably going to get sufficient quantities of organelles on opposite sides of the cell. Now, if you're familiar with something that's important as the chloroplast in a mitochondria, here you can see the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, production of ATP, what you may uh, or may know, may not, is that these organelles were thought to be once free-living uh, bacteria from long ago that have been incorporated through the endosymbiotic theory. And so they contain their own ribosomes, they contain their own uh, circular DNA. And as it turns out, they're capable of replicating on their own. And so these cells, during the process of, my of, of cell division, will replicate, and then they'll literally like fuse into smaller pieces. And then when the cells 
come back together, they fuse back together again. And they use the cytoskeleton to help guide their passage uh, to opposite sides of the cell. I find that to be kind of interesting. Now, when you get into something like the, the Golgi apparatus, and, and let me see if I can attempt to draw this, this endomembrane system. If you take something like this and then you break it up into smaller vesicles, like this, and, and one of these vesicles is shown here, these vesicles could be guided through uh, the tubulin proteins, the microtubules, and motor proteins can literally assist this. But again, you're getting, you're getting into the idea that if the Golgi and ER break into smaller, it's back to that uh, abundant organelle idea that probably all things being equal, they're going to be divided uh, appropriately. But then they, when they return or to the other side of the cell, they start to re-aggregate into um, their original structure. That's kind of kind of interesting. And so the machinery of, of cell division has a lot to do with proteins, and, and so is the regulation as it turns out. And so these proteins that are really important are the spindle, I was uh, alluding to them, which are composed of the microtubules, and also of, of critical importance are the cyanocore fibers. And those are these this protein complex, literally thousands of proteins uh, that are connected to the centromere. And this is how this, the spindle fibers engage the chromosome. Right there, they attach to the kinetochore fibers. Now, the spindle uh, is coming and growing from an area known as the centrioles. And so this is an area where uh, tubulin protein begins, uh, and it grows in uh, the direction toward the chromosome in a positive end. And so the contractile proteins you may be familiar with are composed of thin filaments like actin, that, which are in, important in when the cell is actually dividing during cytokinesis. So a lot of proteins which make up the machinery of cell division. So this particular video is going to be focused on how eukaryotic cells, those cells that possess a nucleus, are regulated. And so that, that's really important. If you really think about it, um, it's remarkable how each of our cells of our body um, divide at different rates. And, and it's important, like for normal growth and development and maintenance, so in other words, like uh, the cells that line our digestive tra tract, and so the, the cells that make up our alimentary canal on the inside, our endothelial cells, uh, they divide pretty often because they're, they're being sloughed off by the food that we eat. And so they divide approximately uh, once a day. I think that's pretty often. But then if you contrast that with during embryonic development, our, the embryo, the cells are undergoing massive uh, cell division. So dividing every eight minutes. Can you imagine if, if our cells were dividing that rapidly today? And so what's fascinating is um, what controls the rate at cell division and what causes a cell to actually enter into cell di division are our questions. And so uh, another example is that, you know, when in terms of maintenance, if some, we get injured and our skin is, is broken here and you can see the dermis is cut, these cells are going to need to divide. And so these cells are, are frequently dividing as well. So it's an example of cells that undergo the cell cycle more frequently than others. And so you might be familiar with this sort of cartoon drawing of the cell cycle. Let me refresh you. The interphase is the longest phase of the cell cycle. It's composed of G1, uh, which is a growth period. It used to be known as GAP1. And then S, which is characterized by the nucleic acid of the of the cell being replicated. Of course, that's most important because each new daughter cell is going to need a copy of the nucleic acid. And then G2, and then the mitotic phase, and then of course cytokinesis. But did you know that there's sort of a checkpoint towards the end of G1, and I'll just put it in right there. A checkpoint is sort of a, an executive phase. If you can think about it in terms of its decision-making time. In other words, the cell needs to assess whether or not it's big enough. To divide. It's got to have enough cytoplasm uh, before it's able to divide or else it becomes teeny tiny, um, little tiny cells that, that won't be able to survive. Are there sufficient nutrients around in order to sustain the cell during uh, cell division? So this is important. So checkpoint meaning that if it doesn't have this criteria, then it will not go past that. So it's kind of a kind of a stop sign, if you will. And so uh, there's three checkpoints, as it turns out, and that the cell, and this is what this video is about, 
if the cell cycle is regulated by internal controls, but it's also uh, uh, regulated by external adjustments as well, as I'll mention towards the end of the video. But we have this checkpoint uh, before cell division takes place. And so two of the checkpoints occur during interphase, it's called G G1 checkpoint. And then at the end of G2, there's a second uh, checkpoint. And so at this point, the cell sort of another executive decision and sort of uh, assesses whether or not DNA has been replicated successfully or not before it goes on to mitosis. And then the M checkpoint it, uh, ascertains whether or not the chromosomes are all lined up and that the kinetic cores and the spindle fibers are engaged properly. If that isn't the case, then it could be trouble because then the chromosomes will separate during anaphase inefficiently and maybe more will go to one side of the cell or the other and that can result in abnormal chromosome number and that's pretty important. Okay, and so these checkpoints are sort of critical and they're the point of, of where stop or go signals will regulate the cycle. And so they come from sort of a cellular surveillance and, and, and like I was just describing, they sort of ascertain whether or not the key processes during the, in, during the cell cycle are completed correctly, and if they're completed correctly, then the cell is, is good to go and it's a, able to proceed. And as I mentioned, we know that there's three checkpoints, G1, G2, and M. So the decision to divide or not divide. So if the cell, for, for a variety of reasons, decides that it isn't going to divide, it doesn't need to go on into the S phase. And so at that G1 checkpoint, it could decide to go into something that's known as G0. In other words, the cell is not in a, in a, uh, a division type of phase in its life. And so um, cells that are in interphase, uh, most of our cells, as it turns out, are in this G0 phase. And it has to do with the fact that there may be lack of growth factors present, or there may not be enough nutrients or the cells, uh, for a variety of reasons, don't want to divide at this given time. Here's a picture of some plant cells that are in interphase right here. Perhaps it's G0. And so it's a pause. And so for, for cells, the G1 checkpoint is sort of a restriction point. Uh, in most mammalian cells, uh, the cell receives the go-ahead signal um, when, it's, when it's good to go. In other words, the nutrients are, are good. Everything is in set in place, and so it'll move on. But if not, as I mentioned before, it'll go into this non-dividing uh, phase called G0. And again, most cells are in this G0 phase. We're just now learning, uh, researchers are learning how cells can sort of come back from G0 phase back into the cell cycle. Uh, there's sort of growth factors that can induce them to do that. Like, for example, liver cells are prone to not want to divide uh, sort of a little advice to take care of your liver, liver. and also muscle cells and, and some nerve cells are sort of perpetually in this G0 phase and we're just now learning how we can pull them back into the cell cycle and that's important. Uh, so S is also during interphase. S stands for synthesis, DNA synthesis in particular. It should be noted that we're talking about genomic or nuclear D or DNA uh, that, that is actually being replicated during S. The DNA that's in chl chloroplasts and mitochondria sort of uh, replicate at all times during the cell cycle sort of autonomously. Now, how long is S phase? Uh, it's difficult to say. It really depends on the length of the genome uh, of the organism. Now, this G2 uh, checkpoint I was men mentioning before, it's sort of another one of those um, interphase checkpoints. So there's three of them. M, there's the M checkpoint. This one sort of ascertains whether or not the cell uh, wants to go into mitosis or not, and it wants to make sure if DNA has been replicated and it makes sure that everything is good in terms of DNA synthesis. So that's an important one. And then the M checkpoint is a checkpoint to, to assure, I mentioned this before, that all the chromosomes are attached properly to the metaphase uh, plate. Um, and so that anaphase can uh, occur without any uh, mishaps. In other words, chromosomes not being pulled to, uh, to the wrong direction so that you don't have any missing chromosomes on one side or extra on the other. 
And if you did have extra, you might be familiar with this. It's a, it's a concept called aneuploidy. Maybe one of the most famous of all examples is um, trisomy. Instead of having uh, two pairs of homologous chromosomes of the 21st chromosome pair, you have three. So it's referred to as Down syndrome. But it's any situation of aneuploidy where you can have uh, N, which is the number of, of chromosomes plus one or N minus one. So it's an abnormal chromosome numbers. And so as it turns out, researchers from a lot of top universities in the world, especially at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, have been studying uh, cancer cells. And there's, a, there's always been known a strong association with cancer cells having abnormal chromosome numbers. And as you can see here, uh, some of the chromosomes are not being separated properly. And so there's a strong link between uh, the cell cycle and cancer, and in particular, aneuploidy. And so it behooves scientists to study these checkpoints and to understand what are the chemical basis of how cells uh, align chromosomes and how the spindle operates. And so it's really important to understand that. And so the investigation of how the cell cycle is regulated really comes down to an understanding of you know, what is normal if you look at, at, at the cell cycle. And if you can understand what's normal, you can then figure out what's going wrong in cancer cells, or likewise. Uh, sometimes the inverse is true as well. And so we're going to take a look at this. And so the story of regulation of cell cycles sort of begins, in terms of my discussion here at least, is a study of these uh, mammalian cells in culture. Like, so here's a Petri dish. Uh, here's some, some sort of liquid media. And cells can be cultured or simply grown in a Petri dish. These look to be, since they're sort of star-shaped, uh, a very common type of cell in the body known as a fibroblast cell. It's found in connective tissue. It's very common in the skin. And so you can grow that. And so as it turns out, uh, during the 1970s approximately, we were just beginning to understand that there might be some sort of molecular control. So suggestive of the fact that there's some, uh, some molecules in the cell that actually regulate the cell cycle. And so the early experiments suggested this. So if you took uh, a cell, and here's the, here's the cell uh, nucleus and it's in S phase and so the cell is replicating its DNA. I won't get into the detail of this but you can get cells to fuse together using some some um, viral genes that allow the cell membranes to fuse together and so what's interesting if you take a cell that's in S phase and, and unite it and fuse it together with a cell that's in G1 look what happens it turns out that the cell both nuclei and in particular, the G1 becomes S. And so it's suggestive of the fact that there might be something perhaps in the cytoplasm that is initiating this cell to turn itself into S uh, more quickly than it would otherwise. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that. It could also mean, for example, uh, there are some of the replication uh, enzymes that are involved uh, in the synthesis of DNA can actually have diffused into this nucleus to cause the synthesis to uh, occur. So kind of interesting. And so um, a, a, a paper was published in Nature magazine in, in the 1970s sort of discussing this. If you took, this is kind of interesting, if you took a cell here that's undergoing mitosis, so here's the nuclear membrane breaking down, the centrioles are on opposite sides of the cell, there's now four of them, here's a chromosome. If you get these cells to fuse together, Look what's happening here. Now, G1 doesn't just go into S, but rather it goes immediately into mitosis, which is suggestive of the fact that there might be some kind of chemicals in the cytoplasm that are initiating the mitotic phase of the cell cycle. Notice here that there's only uh, one chromatid uh, because the DNA hadn't replicated yet. And so normally uh, you see a chromosome in prophase because S phase replicates the DNA. And so that's kind of interesting. So the fusion of a cell in mitosis with another one induces the other one into mitosis, curious. So perhaps there's some sort of molecular trigger in the, in the, in the fluid of the cell, something in the juice, something in the cytoplasm that initiates the cell cycle. And so a couple of different 
labs were working on seemingly unrelated uh, processes, but when you put them all together, it sort of um, unfolded into what we now know about how the cell is uh, cell cycles regulated. And so uh, there's the discovery of something called uh, maturation promoting factors or MPF factors. Now these are important. So these MPS maturation uh, promoting factors, sometimes they're just simply called M phase for mitosis promoting factors. Uh, scientists by the same by the name of Matsui was uh, Masui was working with toads, and in particular, the oocytes or the eggs of the toads. And they don't want to go too far into this, but they're interesting because they have sort of this uh, lunar kind of appearance here where there's a dark side and a light side. And if they have this little white spot, if you're familiar with meiosis, there's meiosis one and meiosis two. Meiosis two is pretty much the same thing as mitosis. And so you can tell that a cell's undergoing meiosis two or mitosis very simply under the microscope by looking at this little white dot. And so he was able to take these toad oocytes and he took a syringe uh, and he pulled out some of the cytoplasm of the cells that were actually actively undergoing meiosis too. And so th this is sort of like mitosis. And so he took the juice from these and he injected them into non-mitotic cells and the cells became mitotic, and so kind of similar to what I was discussing before. Now, what's interesting about that is the juice kept, if you will, if you kept removing the juice, it never became diluted, which was suggestive of the fact that there might be an enzyme involved in the process of what this maturation um, protein was all about. And so it was suggestive of it, of it being an enzyme. So the hypothesis is that the concentration of the MPF would be something like this. So during interphase, it's kind of low, and uh, during mitosis, it goes a little high, and then interphase, it's low, mitosis, it's high, and interphase, it's low. And so this is what was seen uh, in, in, uh, in the experiments. And so another researcher by the name of Tim Hunt was working in uh, something that's seemingly unrelated, but clams, and so clam embryos. Uh, very easy to obtain, easy to study. And so what uh, Tim Hunt was interested in was looking for proteins that would appear during certain phases of the cell cycle. So what proteins appear during mitosis that don't appear during interphase? So what's interesting about that is you can break the cell open. You could separate the proteins using polyacrylamide uh, uh, phoresis, so PAGE, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. And so this is a picture of a gel that, that uh, students in my lab have run, and you can see the separation of proteins based on size. You could sort of see whether or not a protein is present during different phases of, of the cell cycle. And not only if they're present, but in um, a little bit about them. And so you could isolate these proteins using um, various techniques. And so what was interesting about that is that he was able to determine uh, in these clams that there was a protein, and it's shown here in red, there was a protein that was very low in abundance. Okay, this is over here on the, on the y-axis. So it was low in abundance, but when it came just at the onset of mitosis, it, it, it sort of peaked at this point. And then interestingly enough, it sort of disintegrated. It wasn't present in terms of the, the fingerprint during mitosis. And then it appeared to rise again during interphase. And then right at the beginning of mitosis, then it would drop down again. And so he referred to as this protein that he was uh, looking at as cyclin because it was able to cycle up during interphase, drop down during mitosis, cycle up during interphase. And so he sort of hypothesized that there might be some sort of threshold, in other words, a, a concentration of this cyclin protein that when it reached or it passed the threshold of a concentration, that that might initiate mitosis. But what's interesting about it is though the cyclin protein appeared and disappeared and appeared and disappeared like this, the rate of synthesis was constant. So in other words, the cell produced, kind of mysteriously if you're following this, the cell was able to produce this 
cyclin protein continuously, but yet its abundance went up and then it went down during mitosis and it went up during interphase and it went down. Okay, so that's slightly mysterious. And so Hunt found, actually it turns out, several cyclins that were abundant at different times of the cell cycle. So they're given names, they're cyclin D, cyclin E, A, and B. But as you can see, they sort of go up and go down. And so they're capable of cycling, okay? <laughs> kind of, kind of a, a good name for a protein that, that cycles, cycling. So other geneticists working with yeast, scanning electron micrograph of, of the single-celled eukaryotic cell, and this is what they look like when they're dividing. They sort of form this bud right here, or the, the, the new daughter cell. Now, what was interesting is these, these geneticists were pulling proteins out during the cell cycle and uh, sequencing the protein. So that, in other words, they came up with the amino acid sequence. Now, I don't know if you're familiar, we have this National Cell um, Biology uh, website, NCBI, that you could actually enter DNA sequences or protein sequences, and they sort of compare, and you put that into the library and the computer, like scans, like, well, what proteins do you, what, what is the function? Is it like, uh, is this protein like a protein that we've seen before and we know? So, as it turns out, scientists were noticing that there was a lot of uh, kinases that were um, present during the cell cycle. And so um, when you put that in, or proteins, and when you put that into the database, it turns out that these were very similar to protein kinases. Now, protein kinase uh, is a type of protein that's enzymatic, and it simply transfers phosphate groups, okay, negatively charged phosphate groups, um, onto, could be anything, but onto other proteins. And usually when a cell has a phosphate transferred to it, it changes its tertiary conformation, giving it sort of activity, allowing it to be able to do something. And so this is ra rather important. So these protein kinases are kind of the, the enzymes that are phosphorylating proteins that are getting things done in the cell and so that are sort of powering mitosis as it turns out. So as I mentioned, here's a protein and here's the kinase enzyme. It takes, a, it takes a phosphate group, usually from ATP, it sticks it onto the protein and now this protein is activated right there. And so uh, the point being, I'm not going into the detail, but the point being is now the cell is able to do something. So these protein kinases are, are able to do that. Now, there's a rhythmic fluctuation in the abundance of the activity of these molecules during the cell cycle, as I was alluding before. So what's interesting about it is the level of these kinases are present at a constant amount. Okay, so this is what we're talking about, these kinases here. But as it turns out, the, the cyclin protein, as it turns out, fluctuates. And so these protein kinases have now been called cyclin-dependent kinases because as it turns out, the, cy the cyclin fits into the kinase enzyme and makes it an active protein kinase. So as it turns out, those kinases that were discovered in cells are actually called cyclin-dependent kinases or CDKS. And as it turns out, when you don't have cyclin, or if it's in very low concentration, when it's in low concentration, you won't, the, the cyclin-dependent kinases won't be functioning. So it's sort of dependent on cyclin to be working. So this is forever present. This is always present. This is present sometimes. Okay, hopefully that's clear. And so the synthesis of cyclin uh, is important, and as I was mentioning before, it was discovered that it that it is uh, it begins during uh, interphase, and so it continues all the way through G two, and so it it builds up, it builds up, builds up the the accumulation of cyclin, as you can see here, and then it attaches to the cyclin dependent kinase, making it active. Okay, so when there's a lot of cyclin, MPF will become activated, and so MPF then would promote the various proteins necessary to achieve mitosis, okay? And then, as it turns out, the cyclin is then broken down. As we know, during mitosis, the, there, there's a drop-off of cyclin, okay? 
And if there if the cyclin is is then broken down, CDK is non-functional, okay, even though it's present. Hopefully that was clear. And <laughs> so the cyclin, th this is kind of a difficult concept, and and I I just wanted to pause and, and acknowledge that, and just tell you that uh, I'm hopeful that. Uh, this might be a conversation that is the, a catalyst, if you will, pun intended, uh, to, for further study of how cells are regulated. But cyclin builds up during interphase, and it reaches a certain point. And when it interacts with the, with the uh, cyclin-dependent kinase, it then forms the MPF factor, which then initiates the mitosis, and then the cyclin is then... Uh, destroyed or degraded, and therefore the activity is, is diminishes as well. And so this cycles up and down. Okay, and so again, the cyclin accumulates during interphase and interacts with the cyclin-dependent kinase, forming the MPF factor, which then initiates mitosis, and then the cyclin is broken down during mitosis. Okay, so these cyclin levels rise sharply during interphase, then they fall during mitosis. And so uh, it then activates the MPS activity, which uh, initiates mitosis. So this maturation promoting factor, sometimes again, the review, M factor, is what's sort of promoting mitosis. Okay, how's it doing that? That's a, that's a larger question, but it kind of, in, in summary, it phosphorylates other protein kinases that are involved in all the integral steps of mitosis. An example would be like breaking down the nuclear envelope during uh, prophase is an example of that. Okay, so here's the cyclin that's, that is building up during interphase and then it reaches it, the cyclin dependent kinase and then this together is the MPF which then starts to phosphorylate other proteins that initiate the various functions of mitosis. Okay. Now, during anaphase, the MPF factor helps to switch off, which leads to the destruction of its own cyclin. Okay, so that is a really interesting point, too. And I, and I sort of want to pause at this point to sort of uh, take a break from this, and I'll come back and show you a little animation of what I'm trying to discuss here. And so take a look at this. Three principal checkpoints control the cell cycle in eukaryotes. The G1 checkpoint makes the key decision as to whether the cell should divide, delay division, or enter a resting stage. Okay, so we talked about that. You can go into G0 at that point if there's not enough nutrient. The G2 checkpoint assesses the success of DNA replication and triggers the start of the mitosis, M, phase. If this checkpoint is passed, the cell initiates the beginning of mitosis. Okay, so that's important. The accuracy of mitosis. That's important because we want to make sure that synthesis has occurred properly. This is assessed at the M checkpoint. This checkpoint occurs during metaphase and triggers the exit from mitosis and cytokinesis and the beginning of G1. Okay, so I just want to emphasize this. The M checkpoint occurs during metaphase. And again, that's really important. It's sort of like if you're a teacher of elementary school and you want all the kids to get out to recess and come back, it's often fruitful to put them in a line. It's a good way to make sure that no one gets lost in the transition. At the G2 checkpoint, cyclin-dependent kinases, CDKs, phosphorylate histones and proteins that carry the cycle past the checkpoint into mitosis. Okay. During G2, the cell gradually accumulates G2 cyclin, also called mitotic cyclin. So the cyclin is building the up. The cyclin binds to CDK to form a complex called MPF, mitosis promoting factor. That MPF is what initiates mitosis. When the level of MPF exceeds the threshold necessary to trigger mitosis, the G2 phase ends and mitosis begins. One of many functions of MPF is to activate proteins that destroy cyclin. Okay, now that's interesting. So. As you, cyclin is, is this green, and this uh, cyclin-dependent kinase, the MPF factor, does a lot of things to initiate all the functions of mitosis. But one of the things it also does is that it activates a protein that will actually help to degrade the cyclin itself. So isn't that interesting? So when MPF 
uh, is high in concentration. Let me see if I can actually write on top of this. So when the MPF is in high concentration, it not only initiates mitosis, but it actually begins the destruction of cyclin itself. Okay, because you know that cyclin goes down during mitosis. So I find that that's kind of interesting, just to, just to point that out. As mitosis proceeds to the end of metaphase, CDK levels stay relatively constant, but G2 cyclin is degraded, causing progressively less MPF to be available and initiating the events that end mitosis. Okay, so that's, that's pretty interesting. And so when you think about it, let's go back up here for a second. So when you think about it, um, the MPF sort of regulates its own uh, production because it sort of cycles that way. So cyclin-dependent uh, kinases persist, but the MPF is now unable to work because there's no more cyclin. And so the high concentration of MPF destroys the cyclin. And so what's interesting about that is the detail of the breakdown of cyclin is fascinating because it involves these proteins that are just most recently been discovered called ubiquitin. And there's these sort of either small proteins or large peptide groups, and there's many of them. And they sort of attach onto proteins and destroy them. They're sort of like the kiss of death. They attach onto proteins, and so they attach onto these cyclin proteins, and then they transfer them into something called a proteasome, which is analogous to sort of this garbage disposal, where the cyclin proteins go into this literal vessel in the cytoplasm of the cell, and the cyclins are broken up into amino acids, and then the cell can use them. And so there, therefore, the cyclin is broken down during different phases. And so at this, uh, I mentioned before, at this checkpoint, metaphase checkpoint, the cell needs to make sure that the, each daughter cell doesn't end up with opposite uh, numbers of chromosomes, which would result in aneuploidy, and so that's important. And so finally, I want to discuss some of the external cues that are important in addition to the cyclic-dependent kinases and the, and the cyclin. Um, in most cases, just to, you know, as we're transitioning, most of the uh, cyclin-dependent kinases, we're not really sure of what they even do. There's so many of them. And so some of the signals I just wanted to emphasize come from the outside. And so as it turns out, uh, there are these proteins called growth factors that will be important in causing a cell to want to divide. Now these are sort of hormone-like molecules. Hormone is an example of one of these. But another example would be something called the platelet-derived growth factor, or PDGF. And so platelets, when there's an injury, are little tiny cellular fragments that help the blood to coagulate. And so as it turns out, they, they release these factors which cause fibroblast cells, this is the inside of a fibroblast cell, to receive these signals and start to divide, and therefore produce a lot of collagen to repair the tissue. And so as it turns out, we could take uh, fibroblast cells or tissue, break it up, and then actually add the growth factor to the fibroblast cells, and we can actually initiate cell division. And so fibroblast cells in culture will only